place is now. And it's forever. Ghosts of my life. We are We're back. We're the Mark Fisher thing. We're doing Inception this episode. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lost Futures, a Mark Fisher podcast, and I'm Steven, here with Marlo, who's yes. not saying his name because he's on another level. He's in the movie mindset. Sorry, yeah. Chapo. We're taking the name. Um, anyway, so... We're in Christopher Nolan's Inception universe. Um, this is from Film Quarterly, a publication that Mark Fisher has written before. Uh, uh, all right. The name of it is called The Lost Unconscious, Christopher Nolan's Inception. All right. We're 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 talking movies. We're talking blockbusters. Um, we're talking blocks. We're yep. talking Hans Zimmer doing blocks. Yep. The man who does every Bwong in every movie that you've ever been in, like Dune. Ah, bah, bah, bah. Yeah. yeah. Christopher Nolan, if you don't know, you've probably seen one or more of his movies. And it begins we're, with we're a doing scene. doing Inception, the movie Inception. But we don't begin with Inception. We begin yeah, with we be, okay. probably Mark Fisher's favorite movie to quote in this book. Uh, he actually starts out the entire book with a Drake quote about how he feels like the character in Memento. It is, and I quote, Lately I've been feeling like Guy Pierce in Memento by Drake. It's a lyric from one of his songs. Yeah. And in the beginning here we have the scene between Teddy and Leonard. Um, The, The end or beginning of Memento. The physical end of the film Memento chronological beginning where uh, he's confronting Teddy about lying to him this entire time and Teddy is like you're actually lying to yourself this entire time look at your police file it was complete when I gave it to you who took the 12 pages out you probably no you took them out why would I do that to set yourself up a puzzle you won't ever solve (laughs) That's kind of how he delivers it. Anyway, it's, you know, the guy from The Matrix. Also, the Trinity from The Matrix is in it, too. A lot of people from the... Two people from The Matrix are also in Memento. (laughs) Yeah, and and it's specifically the last line to set yourself a puzzle you won't ever solve. Also, Ralph Sifaretto from The Sopranos. Yeah. That Mark Fisher really likes to focus on as this kind of guiding thread throughout this essay. Well, it is very superficially object petita. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very yeah. reductively a, a thesis behind a lot of... Critical theory, Lacan, blah, blah, blah. But also, it's kind of Christopher Nolan's every every movie, you can say. It's, uh, you know, a po- puzzle that you you won't ever solve. Isn't that like the larger... Yeah, okay, well, I mean, what Mark Fisher literally says in the next sentence, like Lenny, Christopher Nolan has specialized in setting puzzles that cannot be solved. So I feel like he got this idea. I got (laughs) it. It was implanted in my mind. (laughs) Yeah. It was incepted into my mind. Okay, so Nolan's work is about duplicity, uh, drawing in audiences in to labyrinths of indeterminacy, number of repeating elements, traumatized hero, his antagonist, a dead woman, plot involving manipulation and dissimulation or reshuffled, film noir trips through the scramble and manner of a certain kind of neo-noir. Nolan acknowledges Angel Heart and usual suspects as major influences. I like the... Fisher acknowledges that Nolan is coolly obsessive quality. And this is something yeah. that well, okay. Marlo has so affected in the last two days watching yeah. this film. Chris we Nolan, watched this film, by the way, last night to my great chagrin because I hate Inception and Marlo ironically I mean, I likes would say ironically. Inception. I would say that Inception... 
fascinates me on a level that a lot of Chris Nolan movies fascinate me on, which is Chris Nolan is such an interesting person who thinks in a very interesting way. He's coolly obsessive. He has a coolly yeah, obsessive like, quality that... He's a 2000s dorm poster dude who sells you weed. He, he is a man, doesn't think too much about stuff. He just likes things that are cool to him. And that kind of comes through. You get to know him as a character in many of his movies, the things he values, the things he doesn't value. What he values, as Mark Fisher says, is he is an ideas man. He's a man of ideas. He's a man of concepts. He's a man of things. He's not so much about filling in those things <laughs> with internal consistency, characters, dialogue, human relationships, human development, love, passion, feelings, anything. Any of that hoity-toity, if you will, nonsense. And that is the man that Christopher Nolan is. And I think that this comes through in the Mark Fisher essay about him. And the level that I watch Christopher Nolan movies, and Inception is a great example of that, is as a film that delivers this man through his work. Okay, so then what kind of man is he? A dumb kind of fascist himbo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he, li he likes cool ideas. He likes cool things. He doesn't understand the ideas, but he likes them. He likes them abstractly, and, and even that comes through in Inception when... Like, the intro scene is Leo selling this as, like, what are the most powerful things in the world. Yeah, which, I mean, okay, so as Mark Fisher points out, there's a very self-help thread that runs throughout a lot of Chris Nolan. And, there, and like, that, a self-help idea of how human psychology works. And, the, yeah, when that opening scene comes off, like, a well in a philosophical sense it, it sounds like leonardo dicaprio and wolf of wall street sell me this pen yeah it, it sounds like you know a big fucking power broker meeting of like what's the most powerful thing in the world an idea the strongest muscle the brain <laughs> like you know well he, he mentions it later but he it is the most kind of idealist you know, thing like it is a mind palace that you're in of Christopher Nolan when you step into these movies because he's all idea but no substance. Yeah, absolutely. And also, as I, I said before, the thing with Christopher Nolan, like, and and Mark Fisher really like pointed out dead wife, hero, and antagonist, blah blah blah. You know, so with Chris Nolan, there's two types of women that exist. Are the dead kind <laughs> and the bad kind. <laughs> and, you know, in Memento, this was very clear with the off-camera dead wife who never seemingly actually existed. And the bad lady, which is Trinity from The Matrix. And in Inception, he really actually subverted his own tropes because he made the dead lady also the bad one. Who is Who's played, played by, a, man. by a person who has since transitioned to a man, but is a female character in this movie. And Elliot Page. We're talking about Elliot Page. Yeah, we're talking about Elliot Page's character, Adriana. Adri Adri With an impossible fucking name to <laughs> pronounce. Like fucking Game of Thrones ass bullshit. But anyway, in this case, uh, this character is literally has no goddamn personality or any defining features and might as well be dead. So again, he includes both the dead and the bad in this one. And also, in case you weren't sure, if. Mal is bad. Let me point out <laughs> that the name Mal means bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, and and you might be thinking this means Christopher Nolan is a sexist, and you would sort of be right. But it's actually, for all you feminists out there it's actually who are like, oh, he names his female protagonist 
the bad. Yeah, and also th- there's no such thing as a female protagonist. Women aren't people. They're tools to define the Man. protagonist of his movies. But I just have to point out, there's also no protagonist in a Christopher Nolan movie. There, there's, there's no characters because he doesn't give a shit. He doesn't know what a person is. He, he has no fucking idea. Like, I, I mean, Interstellar. Oh, maybe love is the force of the universe. Like, that is just Christopher Nolan saying, I don't know what love is. But I read a book on quantum physics. <laughs> I don't know maybe that he it's did. Like that. I don't know that he did read a book on he quantum physics. He watched a YouTube video that featured Neil deGrasse Tyson. And he said, oh, well, that's like a weird scientific concept. Maybe, like, if love could be that. And he has no idea what a feeling is. In <laughs> Memento, like, I've made the comment, like, this hating on Inception. I, I say Inception compared to what? I say, what is the alternative to Inception? What do you want? Do you want a Lynch um, movie? I, and you're I, like, I, oh, well, we want something like Memento. But I just have to say, no, Memento, same fucking bullshit. Absolutely the same fucking bullshit he does in all his movies. There's no character motivation. There's, like, revenge. Oh, yeah, like, okay, like, there are people in the world whose wives were murdered. Like, this is a thing that happens. Most of them don't just kill people. And, you know, it suffices in movie world that that's, like, your character's only defining, like, thing it's literally the only continuity that makes him a complete person but like no it makes no goddamn sense in any sort of reality anyway like chris nolan cannot be bothered with details with characters with human beings thoughts emotions feelings he doesn't know how people work he just has like some like kooky little thoughts in his head where he's like oh what if this and then he like does it and that's all he does well one thing you have talked about off before this podcast started recording was that Inception compared to what, but also it seems like Mark Fisher wants the movie to be more than how you process the movie. And right. most of the criticism is in this lack of... It's not a David Lynch movie. It's, no, it's, it's not even that. Is that like the bare bone, the bare minimum? There's nothing of like related what, to dreams in this movie. There's no dreams in this movie. What, they just call no, them but dreams. What this movie fails on at every step of the way is to be engaging and to have stakes, like basic movie shit that obviously. Oh, yeah, there's stakes. You'll get. They said it. They said the stakes are we'll get trapped in limbo for a million years. Uh, motivations are ever... He wants to see his kids. Unclear. Okay, again, Nolan checks fucking boxes. You want to, like, quiz Nolan on what his <laughs> outline says? He wrote the outline. He didn't write okay. the fucking script. And, he wrote the outline, though. And that that goes back to what Mark Fisher says, that there are, there are rules... Uh huh. Are crucial to no one's method. Right. Exactly. He is a man of outline. If memento is a kind of impossible object, then its impossibility is generated not via an anything goes ontological or anarchy, but by the setting up of rules which it violates in particular ways. It violates in no particular ways. It violates because Christopher Nolan forgot them. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's be clear again. It's not these were not choices Christopher Nolan made. No, but I still see it as a symptom of someone who yes has high concept, and the problem with high concept is the fact that the concept itself muddies up a lot of the details. Yeah, no, I know. Yeah, Christopher and Nolan's the details not lose a lot of people when they watch a movie or. In the case of Inception, at least... Simulate high intellectualism right. for a lot of the audience. Right. Yeah, no, like, no, that that's Christopher Nolan's biggest Chad move, is he makes a movie that's incredibly fucking stupid. That, like, actually it's like, there's a lot of the movie that it's just like, no, this does, like, actually make sense, you just need to fucking pay attention. Uh, but there are, like, some things in the movie where it's like, 
oh no, 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 that's just continuity error. Like, don't, don't, no, it's fine. Nolan forgot. It's cool. It's like in Dark Knight Rises when, like, all of a sudden it was nighttime. Like, he, he forgot it was daytime, so now it's nighttime. He's the director. You're living in his world. I yeah. hate it so much. I'm going to keep saying that. I do not like this movie. And Marlo and I, this is a rift between us that has plagued our conversations. We completely agree with every conclusion Mark Fisher right, draws. But, but <laughs> we have different conclusions about the movie. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, anyway, well, whatever. He, like, summarizes Inception. That's fine. We... We kind of gave a rundown of our own. There is this kind of thing where he describes Mal in an interest. Mal remains obsessed with the idea that she, the world around her, is not real. So she throws herself from the hotel window in order to return to what she believes is the real world. You know, kind of setting up this tragic dead wife thing mm -hmm. that... May echo the last uh, essay we looked at with the guy that had his grandmother <laughs> That wasn't in the <laughs> essay, though. No, but uh, it's just funny that it's being brought up that there are lots of women throwing themselves off of high places in our podcast. And how the movie kind of gets to the trauma of Cobb. Um, yeah, or like, you know, what Nolan thinks trauma is. <laughs> Beautiful story, tell us all this time. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, where we at? Then he compares it to other Nolan films. He compares it to Insomnia, where uh, Al Pacino, if you haven't seen Insomniac, Insomnia? Insomnia. Insomniac with David Tell. Yeah. <laughs> Insomnia with Al Pacino and a darkly played... Uh, yeah, Robin Williams. Robin Williams. Williams. Is doing that in the one-hour photo as his two, like, attempts at, like, genre twisting. Like, oh, uh, no, Robin Williams is playing a psychopath bad guy. And so he can't sleep. Both or or Al, pa Al Pacino like, uh, can't sleep. It's one of my favorite Nolans, Insomniac, and it's because he didn't write it. Insomnia. 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 <laughs> he didn't write it. It's a previously done movie mm -hmm. that he then remade. So. Well, I mean, did he do the script? No. The uh, okay. Well, maybe he... Maybe he re yeah, I mean, you are still writing the movie if you write the remake. The movie. He he did a cover of an old. Yeah, well, so is the Prestige, and that's awful. No, you like Insomnia well, because it's like different uh, no, genre wise and like well, the generally different than the a, Prestige is different because it's an adaptation of a book, right? Not a redo of an old movie. Yeah, I'm just saying, like remaking a movie is still making a new movie. You just all right, all right, all right. <laughs> Insomnia, the Prestige. He's, you know, kind of running it down. So we have Memento, Insomnia, The Prestige, and then we get to, like, Cobb's quest and the apparent rediscovery of his children could be a version of the same kind of loop, Purgatorio to Memento's Inferno, which I kind of liked. One of my favorite lines in this whole essay is, the differences in the way that the concept of shared dreaming is handled in 1977 and 2010 tell us a great deal about the contrast between social democracy and neoliberalism. Now, this is a thing that he has used before in capitalist realism, if you're already familiar with that. Basically, his heat versus goodfellas and uh, the Godfather, where he says this is the perfect way you can see the difference between post-Fordism versus Fordism. Here he's comparing a dream of Wessex and, uh, you know, Christopher Peace's imagination of the dream. Priests. Priest. Being neoliberalized or privatized. And in Inception, you have it, like, Dream sharing technology is the internet, CGI. Yeah, and similar, he points out similar development, like within the very bare bones, like world building they give in Inception, they mention it's a military technology that then saw a commercial use. Which you brought this up that uh, the cell with Jennifer Lopez 
uses the same technology for psychology, which is different than it's used in Yeah, the cell, um, why you listen to our podcast, because you're not going to get this great fucking um, references anywhere else. Mark Fisher didn't come up with this reference, but yeah, the cell is uh, probably the most appropriate movie to compare Inception to. Absolutely. Um... Because it's from a few years before, it's incredibly shitty, uh, and it's like very insane, but it uses exactly the same... It's a very beautiful movie. Every scene in there is supposed to be like Every scene, it, a painting. It, Visually very stunning. Stunning in the way that 2000s girl pop music videos are stunning. Almost like exceedingly glossy... Yeah. hyper terrible cgi because it's like 2003 no it's 1999 okay okay so even better yeah also 99 so like it's obviously it's responding to the matrix um but the deal with the cell is there's also dream sharing technology i find the interesting thing with that is it's a little more grounded in reality, because I think it's far more reasonable we would use dream sharing technology as a therapeutic tool rather than the extremely niche field of corporate espionage. Like most people in the world are not corporate spies. <laughs> um, your life is usually not affected by a corporate spy. It's not a thing that affects most people. It's a cool sounding thing that like... Chris Nolan heard that word one day. But, you know... Well, like, it was kind of in the water in the 90s, too. Like, you look at movies like The Game, and there's sort of like a corporate espionage yeah, kind of shadowy... Final Fantasy Seven. if you really like, want to get down to a it. A shadowy organization that's kind of taken place, like the yeah, 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 Stalinist uh, kind yeah, of commie. It's like, well, also, we're, like, fast-forwarding, we're in 2010. 10 with Inception. As, a, as an application of, hey, I can enter your dream and learn something about you, is that, like, you could see, uh, we're not just, like, entering each other's dreams to do Kung Fu, like in The Matrix. Like, ostensibly, there's probably something related to the person in their dream that you're entering. The conceit of the cell is we would use that for psychotherapy, uh, it seems a lot more reasonable than using it for uh, corporate espionage. But then in the cell, they then use it to catch a Vincent weird BDSM. D'Onofrio. Vincent D'Onofrio playing this like extremely elaborate BDSM setup. Like this man spent four hundred thousand dollars on this like fucking Rube Goldberg machine to drown women so he can jack off. <laughs> um, and the, and most of the dreamscapes, Steve said every thing is like a painting. It's also like just weird fucking BD. Like it's also trying to be Hellraiser. Like it's, it's definitely trying to be Hellraiser with like using BDSM well, and imagery there's, as horror. There's definitely a Bataille-esque, yes. um, libidinal yes. yeah, there's edge. A, it's very Bataille. Which is completely absent from this. This is complete... Yeah, no, I agree. There's less BDSM there's in no, Inception. There's no sex. And this is something you noted about Tolkien, is that there's no you're, sex. You're right. No, okay, again, I will, I will say that Chris Nolan, Ayn Rand, and J.R.R. Tolkien are three fascist. sort of fascist creators of imaginary worlds who cannot be bothered with anything to do with, like, individuals or characters, let alone them having sex. That is disgusting. really disgusting and gross <laughs> and annoying and distracts from the story you're trying to tell. And you need to tell stories in spite of them being populated by people rather than tell stories about people. And that's absolutely the approach of those three creators and definitely the approach of Nolan. So anyways, Mark Fisher continues to pillage this film with his... I think you mean Pillaroy? No, I'm saying he pillages it with words. Inception not entirely satisfactorily 
synthesizes the intellectual and metaphysical puzzles of Memento, the Prestige, with the big budget ballistics of Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. The problem is the prolonged action sequences which come off as perfunctory at best. At points, it is as if Inception's achievement is to have provided a baroquely sophisticated motivation for some very dumb action sequences. Fuck yeah. An unkind viewer here is where I have underlined Marlowe. Yeah, okay, I found this <laughs> sentence very interesting. An unkind viewer might think that the entirety of Inception's complex ontological structure had been constructed to justify cliches of action cinema, such as the ludicrous amount of things that characters can do to the time that it takes for a van to fall from a bridge into a river. Marlo I, has thoughts on this. I 100% uh, agree that that's exactly what this movie is. I don't think I'm unkind, I kind of like this movie. <laughs> Because of that. And I'm in Mark Fisher's camp here where I agree with him and find that to be an annoying part of... It's like, why watch the movie? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, oh, no, I thought it was, like, an exploration of the human psyche. Like, <laughs> fuck you. Like, have you watched this? Like, he doesn't know what it means to mourn the loss of... A father. <laughs> like, he clearly doesn't. Like, this isn't an exploration of the human psyche. He doesn't know what the fuck that is. It's, yeah, it's a fucking excuse for him to write three short action movies, mash him up in the middle of a different movie, and bookend it with plot exposition to explain why you just watched that. That's all he's doing. Well, that's what we signed up for. Your mind is the scene of the crime. <laughs> Why? See, all the reasons you're saying <laughs> that you like this movie for its dumb action yeah, is exactly why I dislike it. Because I want a psychological thriller. Yeah, no, I mean, like, yeah, you know, I, yeah, there was a lack of BDSM injury. There was a lack of, like, dwarves speaking backwards in, like, some Native American <laughs> afterlife or whatever the fuck you kids like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah 30 years, 33 years ago, the kids were really yeah. into it. Yeah, no, you know, you're Winona Riders and all that shit. Like, yeah, I agree, like movie isn't a different movie than it is. <laughs> um, Blogger Carl Neville complains that Inception amounts to three uninvolving action movies playing out simultaneously. Complains or states factually. <laughs> what could have been a fascinatingly vertiginous trip into successively fantastic impossible worlds. I don't think not you people want Christopher Nolan to actually take you into what he thinks the human mind is because it's probably terrifying. <laughs> like, like, he's an extremely stupid fascist. Like, I, I, I don't want to know, like, him trying to actually think about it. Now, something. you said this a number of times, but our, our listener doesn't exactly uh, have insight, can't incept your mind. So why do you find Christopher Nolan to be a fascist? In okay. a political... Uh, yeah, no, like, I mean, literally, the, his Batman trilogy is the, the high-budget fascist filmmaking in a way that, like, Paul Verhoeven has only satirized. <laughs> um, like... Like, like, the Batman, the Nolan Batman trilogy is, like, the superhero movies that would exist in... Uh, like the propaganda outfit of a Starship Trooper. Yeah, universe. in the Starship, it would it'd just be the kind of superhero movies we'd watch in the Starship Troopers universe. Wow, because we watch them in this universe. But, um, <laughs> there's something to be said for his dismissiveness of, like, humans. <laughs> um... <laughs> women humans in particular but not to the exclusion of other humans who he also finds annoying and dismissive of like like all the batman movies are just like oh my god i wish i could just kill everyone in gotham city so i wouldn't have to save them anymore it's really annoying that i have to save oh, these is... undeserving fucking pigs oh. especially when there's 
uh, populist but uprising. But uh, again, that being said, I fucking love that trilogy. Like, I'm not gonna pretend I don't. Like, I'm not saying, like, fascist, like, it's just, it's fascist. I mean, you know, that's what you're watching. Hey, we're not pretending we're not watching fascist propaganda. It is. It's Christopher Nolan. Especially ba- uh, The Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, well, The Dark Knight Rises, he's just been doing a blog post. Um, yeah, Dark Knight Rises, he's just, like, putting thoughts out there. Which we'll get to, because Mark Fisher has good thoughts about, I mean... Yeah. Interesting thoughts um, about... I mean, when you don't deal Ma- with characters, you just have to deal with, like, Campbellian archetypes, which is literally all he ever fucking does, of just, like, man needs do thing. And that's, like, all his characters, and that's all, all his fucking movies, and whether you're trying to revive this lost form of the epic poem like Tolkien, or writing shitty novels about why we should be more fascist like Rand, or, you know, making incredibly fun and cool movies like Christopher Nolan <laughs> about man in his quest to defeat adversary and avenge woman who like is incidental and doesn't deserve anything and she only exists for the man um what could have been a fascinatingly vertiginous trip into successful fantastic impossible film of worlds not to mention the limbo of the raw unconscious into which a couple of the central characters plunge ends up looking wholly like a series of action movies one within the other Reality looks and feels like a globalization movie. Jumping from Tokyo to Paris to Mombasa to Sydney with a team of basically decent technical geniuses who are forced to live outside the law, making sure there are lots of helicopter shots of cityscapes and exotic local color. Level 1 dream is basically the born identity. Rainy, gray, urban. Level two is the Matrix. Zero gravity, fist fights in the modernist hotel. Level three depressingly turns out to be a 70s Bond film, while the raw it is basically or just a collapsing cityscape. Level one of Time Splitters 2. Marlo keeps going back to this. So, Time Splitters 2 has this game from the 2000s. It's a first person shooter, but it was like very much a genre parody like or genre referential first person shooter like the setup was just like we have a time portal and every time you go through the time portal you go through a different like location and you become a different person so each level is just a reference to something uh and level one is a snow fortress in vaguely 90s soviet which is you know in 2004 four to six or whenever the fuck this game came out it was presented as a genre parody of first person shooters because this is such a tropey level even then and it looks exactly the same as the snow fortress in inception well he compares it to on her majesty's secret service i uh, guess which has a famous I don't remember. I did see the movie, but I, I do not remember it. That was the one with... Uh, George Lazenby. I know... The only one with George yes, Lazenby. I know that on Her Majesty's Secret Service, it's the George Lazenby one. Tracy Bond's in it. Tracy Bond dies. James Bond has a dead wife. Comes <laughs> Nolan's <a thing>. favorite. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess... Okay, yeah. So there's your connection. There you, there you there's go. There's your connection. He watched that movie and was He's like... He's like, oh, that's... What, what women should do um, <laughs> is be dead wives um, for, for male protagonist. Yeah. Hey, fucking Chad, dude. <laughs> like, Marlo. Marlo is just... <laughs> he's so funny. He's such a funny guy. He's a jokester. Chris Nolan should be understood as a jokester. The elaborate setup involving the dream architect, Elliot Page... This character is summarily abandoned as she is told to forget the labyrinth and find the most direct route through. When Ariadne in the film accede to these demands, it is as if the imperatives of the action thriller 
have crashed through the intricacies of Nolan's puzzle narrative with all the subtlety of the freight train that erupts into the cityscape in an earlier scene. The Virgin says, oh, I need a satisfying way to bring my movie to a conclusion. <laughs> Chad says, movie's done now. <sighs> It's just a slog to get through. Yeah, I would argue that actually the stupid, but in like very different ways, but also like equally fun. Interstellar has aged better in terms of, eh, probably also a slog to get through. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like McConaughey can carry it. I'll, I'll give that a rewatch. We'll see how that is. It's probably also sucks. Um, One of the things he mentions here is that, uh, a strange thing about Inception is how undreamlike the dreams in the film are. Oh, yeah. And this becomes a big thing for Fisher because one of the expectations behind this, which is implied, is that dreams should be fantastical, surreal. Um, but instead, as he says, uh, Frederick is a subver inverted version of Frederick Jameson's surrealism without the unconscious. However, this is the unconscious without surrealism. Yep. Cobb and Mal create their memories like a PowerPoint presentation of a love affair rendered as some walkthrough simulation, faintly haunting in its very lack of allure, quietly horrifying in its solipsistic emptiness, where the unconscious was, there CGI shall be. He also mentions the trial. Have you seen the movie? Orson Welles' rendering of Kafka's The Trial. Oh, uh, no, I've never actually seen it. I've heard movie. it was bad. Yeah, I've heard it was terrible. But he says here that it's a film that perhaps better than any other captures the uncanny topographies of the anxiety dream. So yeah, okay. maybe, it's, maybe it's good. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always trusted Mark Fisher to, like, tell me a good thing that I'll like. <laughs> <laughs> Is that sarcasm? Yeah, that's absolutely sarcastic. <laughs> me and Mark Fisher's tastes rarely come together. <laughs> okay, and here's the other thing that you were mentioning last night while we were watching it and talking over the movie so that I only got about... 10% of the movie, which is fine because I don't like the movie. Yeah, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna respect you wanna, like, who wants to watch this movie? <laughs> that there is, like, this back room, what, what did you call it? Uh, backstage play. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a movie about making movies. It was, like, an interpretation that apparently started with his blog post. I mean, Devin Faraci. Like, everyone is sort of a character for, like, yeah, Cobb's the director, Adriadne is the screenwriter, Sato is the, like, producer. Well, he's the big corporate suit, yeah. Yeah, the producer who, like, tries to, like, get really involved in the movie. You know, it, also, he doesn't mention it, but, like, the drug guy, the Indian dude is the special effects guy, blah, blah. It's a fairly common interpretation of the movie that has been around sort of since the movie came out. Well, I mean, this was written in 2011, so, yeah, since the movie came out. And one of the things that keeps coming up in this essay that'll kind of snowball to the finale is that, you know, there's a big territorialization of dreams as a corporate space and that that you're no longer allowed to have dreams as a an escape from reality but as a way to process capitalism right the interior interiority of capitalism is the kind of marxist read on freud freud psycho psychoanalysis right that's like a pretty common yeah, or the Delusian, yeah, whatever the fuck, any Oedipus shit. Then he gets into Total Recall, which you had some thoughts on. Yeah, okay, so yeah, this is where he basically points out that, and, and this is a thing with Nolan, and and this is always like a thing that I, I readily point out with Nolan, is Christopher Nolan uses heightened cerebral thriller elements as window dressings on stupid fucking action movies that he wrote that are extremely straightforward. Like, nothing in Inception is actually 
ambiguous. It totally works on an internal logic that you can like kind of glean from the first watch through of the movie. There is a real and there is a fake. It's not postmodern. There is a very delineated actual thing that's happening in the movie and not actual thing that's happening in the movie. And you might be screaming, oh, what about the ending with the top? Yeah, that is a thing Nolan put in there because he thought it looked cool. Uh, and you shouldn't think about that or give credit to it or spend any time going through it. Because if you do, you'll realize there's no scenario in which he's actually dreaming at the end. And Fisher compares this to a string of sci-fi movies that came out in the 80s and 90s that were essentially dick light, let's say. They are uh, movies that were not based on Philip K. Dick stories that were clearly written to look like they were based on Philip K. Dick stories. Uh, he names Videodrome, which I'm vaguely aware of, Total Recall, which I obviously have saw, and Existence, which I have no fucking idea what the fuck that is. Anyway, and in those movies, they are actually quite postmodern in the sense that there is, you know, to use Total Recall as the, like, example that, like, I've actually seen, it's entirely baked into the movie. It is not a tacked-on thing that the entire plot of the movie could be an inserted memory that the main character got at the beginning because like all the shit that went down went down after he started the inserted memory process and he specifically asked to be a secret agent and the entire plot then fulfilled the thing that he said could you simulate this for me and they're like okay let's turn on the simulation machine and then the rest of the movie happened Obviously, there is a question. Oh, maybe that's all simulated. And that's not like a bullshit. That's not, oh, by the way, Dumbledore's gay. Like, that's a very much, in that movie from the beginning, very clear. Um, Inception, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And those elements are mere simulations of these 80s, 90s simulations of Philip K. Dick. Yeah, traces of Philip yeah, K. Dick. Yeah, yeah. We're just simulacring Philip K. Dick. But with the case of... Inception. Inception of Nolan, he kind of very much goes in very opposite reaction, direction of saying, no, oh, there's a real and fake. This is a very much a straightforward action movie. We are using the aesthetics of cerebral Philip K. Dickensian theory and aesthetics to simulate thoughts in your brain to make you think this is cool. He incepts the coolness. As Fisher points out, like, he thinks this is, on one hand, a stupid thing that he is doing. Because yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> it doesn't have much continuity and like the whole gimmick if the if the top s stops spinning then it oh, yeah, in reality doesn't actually make any sense then he's in reality either. and if he's and if it keeps spinning without falling then he's in a dream right that's the logic yeah that's the logic but that I mean, that's the rules but that doesn't make any sense no, it, it makes sense because Nolan told it to you. <laughs> like, and you're figuring to watch this movie, so you agree that made sense. And Fisher points this out, consistently mislabeling the top as a, as a thimble. Yeah, okay, so Mark Fisher calls what is clearly a top. That spins. This is a spinning top. And like it does a... not fit over any digit of the human body. <laughs> It's, it's cannot <laughs> protect a finger from being stuck by a needle, cannot hold thread while one is sewing, does not function as a thimble. He calls this object a thimble. We do not know why he does this. <laughs> it's, it's such an odd thing. It's like, did Mark Fisher... He uses the word thimble 27 times on this page. <laughs> <laughs> he uses the word thimble so many times. He he calls it a thimble one time, and I'm like, that's weird. He called that top a thimble. 
And then I kept reading. Like, I kept calling it a fiddle. I think it'd be funnier if he called it a dreidel and it would make more sense. Oh, that would be fine. That'd just be a fucking Gringotts goblin banker. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> That's my second fucking Harry Potter reference. <laughs> now, so we are finally at the part where I was like, are we at this part yet? No, I like this part. Um, he, he makes this interesting point that the top, the totem, <laughs> the top that, um, that uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio has versus the character of Mal. And the top represents lowercase real in the empiricist sense, whereas Mal represents the uppercase Lacanian real as the break point of trauma. And, ah, it's just beautiful. I love that. <laughs> that's, that's a beautiful a, that's analysis. Some good, that's some good critical theory, Mark Fisher, that you just laid down. That is like some... He, he slapped down his theory dick and he, said... He just, like, we are in 8 Mile and you just said mom's spaghetti. <laughs> um, is what happened there. Uh, I, I fucking love that. It's one of the best moments in any of these articles. I mean, he has other good moments, but this yeah, is... no. Anyway, so yeah, so the Lacanian reel, as best I can describe it, and we've discussed it before, but yeah, you know, and like I've said to caretaker fans, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, no, the Lacanian reel is the unmitigated interaction of the mind with the world as one way I can like try and describe okay so for the record Lacan says it's indescribable so you know I, I'm, in, I'm doing Fisher, fine Fisher describes it in Fisher uses realism. it in a lot of different ways that are like vaguely related and the other thing to keep in mind is Fisher's also working off of Zizek more than Lacan directly Zizek very famously really like got into this and like has like eight different kinds of real okay so the Lacanian real the way Lacan kind of describes it at its inception ah but at its Christopher Nolan's inception <laughs> is uh, when we are born, we are little stupid babies. And as babies, our experience is purely sensory. We do not have language to describe it. We do not have preconceived notions of what things look like or should be. We only have our sensory inputs and we don't even have a concept of the self and we are just existing with these sensory inputs and that is the best way I can kind of describe the real and then that goes away as soon as we hit the mirror phase where we develop the imaginary and eventually uh, symbolic, uh, imaginary just being images, symbolic being language, uh, to mitigate the real mm -hmm. and from there we only experience the real uh, mitigated through these imaginary and symbolic except in moments of high trauma or extreme use of hallucinogens are the basic like points of that Zizek and Fisher point to and I think Lacan I does. think that does come directly I could be wrong I do think that actually I mean Lacan was writing in the 60s but yeah like you you get raped you lose a loved one whatever you know the notion of it's in you don't have words to describe it you're just existing and you've lost like your imaginary and symbolic and you're ex and so the real is like yeah it's very much associated with trauma in Lacan's work I can say that much and I think also LSD is was a thing Lacan was pretty fucking aware of <laughs> And yeah, so that is essentially what Mal represents, whereas the top is the tie to the empiricist reality of... The Anglo-Saxon empiricist reality. Sure. Uh, yeah, no, I do like that he... He, he, he qualified does, it. Qualifies it as Anglo-Saxon, and then the other thing is just French. <laughs> obviously, because Lacan. And he... He kind of links it now with my favorite sentence. Grief itself is a puzzle that cannot be solved. 
And there's a certain psychic economy in collapsing the antagonist into the grief object. Since the work of grief is not only about mourning the lost object, it is also about struggling against the object's implacable refusal to let go. I think that's just a really beautiful thing he says. And then he right, immediately... Right, you're trying to explain grief to a man who thinks love is the quantum mechanical force. And then he immediately goes in on, on Nolan, which I know you love. Yet there's something hollow about Cobb's grief oh, on its really? own terms. It oh, doesn't convince there. <laughs> it doesn't convince anything other than a genre required character trait. The man checks box. It is instead to stand in for something else, another sadness, a loss that the film points to but can't name. Yeah. No. He, he, and then he gets into this, I think the other big statement that he makes in this article, which is that well, it's a funny statement, but it's that the entire time, Elliot Page and Leonardo DiCaprio keep saying subconscious when they're describing anything that has to do with the interior Yeah, mind. so if you're a psychotherapy nerd, they should be saying unconscious, not subconscious. You know, you have the conscious, which is the world around you that you're aware of. Mm -hmm. Then the subconscious is... The immediate reaction you have. It's lizard brain. It's what we call lizard brain or reptilian brain, reactive brain. It's, oh, I feel a way when this happens. And it's not inaccessible because you can, in fact, then actively engage your higher functions and say, why do I feel this way? And you might come up with things that you weren't aware of when you felt that way initially. And you're like, oh, wow, this is about my relationship with my parents. Damn, I didn't think it was about that. But now that I think about it, yeah, okay, I can see that. Uh, well, that's subconscious. That's and subconscious. then unconscious is your dreams and the inaccessible and the like actual lower fucking... So much like this film... It is built on these three layers, and Inception is the three layers, right? I wouldn't really start saying Freud, I'm only that saying, Freudian psychoanalysis is I, based on three layers. I, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that it, when you say that um, Chris Nolan is not a postmodernist working on postmodern lack of rules, he's actually working on modernist rules, Freudian psychoanalysis is very much working on modernist rules. Yeah, he's not a very well-read modernist. He doesn't have to be. He just has the rules of it. Freud has the different tiers, and so does Chris Nolan. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Here he makes a very funny thing where he says, this might have been a Freudian slip of a particularly revealing kind, which I think is funny because it's literally about Freud, mm -hmm. which is a good joke. Yeah, sure. Um, but the Freudian slip, uh, he sees, you know, value in that because maybe it's not the unconscious. Maybe it is the subconscious that is being the the interiorized version of the mind that is being. He compares it then to Jean Francois Lyotard, or at least he he uses Lyotard's comment on the unconscious which he described, psychoanalysis described with the help of the images of foreign towns or countries such as Rome or Egypt, just like Pyrenees prisons or Escher's other world. This kind of civilizing of the world, of the world of the mind, right? Like this is the way that Leotard is saying that psychoanalysis is working under, operating in its own rules of how are we thinking of the interior of the mind reflecting back this exterior, right? Mm -hmm. And so he goes in and says, Inception's arcades and hotel quarters are indeed those of a globalized capital, which I think kind of works within a very Fisherian argument where he's saying this is kind of the 
that is the difference between social democracy and neoliberalism. This is the neoliberalism that is being reflected in the interior of Inception's mind palace, right? Yeah. Whose reach easily extends into the former depths of what was once the unconscious. There is nothing alien, no other place here, only a subconscious recirculating deeply familiar images mined from ersatz psychoanalysis. So in place of the eerie enigmas of the unconscious, we are instead offered an Oedipal light scene played out between Robert Fisher and a projection of his dead father. So kind of going along with what you're saying that it is completely just a reactive. Yeah, thing. and also in many ways, uh, uh, the other point he's kind of making, and he, we mentioned it before with the self-helpness of it, but it sort of is representing this final victory and this, you know, we'll get into in capitalist realism of the self-help, cognitive behavioral shit over a philosophical, psychoanalytic. Um, Absolutely. I mean... And in so doing, we're witnessing the victory of post-Fordism over Fordism, of post-modernism over modernism. And that, that, I mean, that's why you get the biggest names in psychoanalysis are the most self-helpy people nowadays. You know, like the Jordan Petersons, the fascists. Well, I, mean, he's, I mean, I'm using psychoanalysis. Well, oh uh, yeah, I guess... Yeah, Jordan Peterson is psychoanalysis. Right, he, yeah. he write, and he writes... Yeah, he's young in. <laughs> he writes the largest psychoanalysis book that is just in a self-help. It literally is kind of working within these rules of... Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is in many ways a bowing down of psychoanalysis to cognitive behavioral of, um, yeah, but what are you doing for me lately? Like, it, of this, like, notion. Because it is, like, well, why are men depressed? Well, the patriarchy doesn't have enough dead wives, I guess. Yeah. No, we all need to have our revenge or dead wives. Yeah. Because um, women need to fit or, into these boxes or, defined by or, patriarchal. What we need to do is find the courage to finally tell our dead wife she's a bitch, <laughs> which is what Inception is about. <laughs> um, see, Inception again really is a- almost in many ways the uber mention of the Christopher Nolan thesis, where it's like. It's not enough for your dead wife to not have a voice, but express herself only through you and your motivations and your own search for meaning. She also needs to have a voice so she can be a terrible bitch that you need to tell off. <laughs> and go and in, find your meaning. Not only that, but go into go into like a shoot deep, her with a fucking sniper rifle, and then be like, "You're dead," <laughs> and I never loved you anyway. Instead, I'm gonna love Adriadne because she knows how to not talk. Well, he gets into the uh, the ending is too simple, and this is uh, yeah. Fine. In Inception, the ego is still not a master in its own house. But that is because the forces of predatory business are everywhere. Dreams have ceased to be the spaces where private psychopathologies are worked through and have become the scenes where competing corporate interests play out their banal struggles. Inception's militarized subconscious converts the infernal urgencies and languid poise of the old unconscious into panicked persecution and the consolatory familialism. Pursued at work by video game gunmen, you later unwind with the kids building sandcastles on a beach. This is another reason that the dreams in Inception appear so undreamlike, for after all, these are not dreams in any conventional sense. The designed virtual spaces of Inception's dreams with their nested levels evidently resemble a video game more than they recall dreams. 
And this reminded me of uh, Matrix Resurrection, where okay. the Matrix... I think I saw that movie. Oh, oh the Resurrection. new one. Oh, the new one. The, the new, new one. one. Yeah, okay, okay. Because the Matrix... Great movie. ...was a video game that Neo was making based on the characters in the movie. That, right, yeah. And the only way that we could establish this external reality was through the making of another one in the form of a video game this time. Yeah. Which yeah. may be sort of what Fisher is saying here about the way All in which... All I'm saying is Inception 2 would be so fucking funny. <laughs> if, if they in actually did Inception it. 2, The Resurrection. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. It would like because it would like just get into the nitty gritty of like actually how the dream technology works, and it would be this like well, boring ass like uh, fucking world building. No, 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 no. I'm imagining that they just do Inception one, but just a, a different heist, a different. Yeah, but I think there would be like a thing where it would be like. Oh, you need to do this heist because the Inception Dream Jump tech company, the company that makes all that, is like strong arming your crew in because we know you're the best. Wait, but okay, but this gets back to heat. Heat too. This is what happened last night. Was we got into this heat is being uh, rebooted yeah, into I, a heat too. We should not get into this before next season. Like. There's no reason to. Um, and Mark Fisher has written about heat. He has not written about heat in this book. <laughs> but Inception 2, Resurrection, the new Inception. Yeah, no, it'd be cool. It'd be really cool, and I hope he does it. I, I bet he will. I bet they're going to make him. They're going to make him do it, <laughs> because that's what studios do now. They make him do it. And then, like, sometimes they'll be like the Wachowskis and make a movie called they made me do this and i hate it and it, like it doesn't matter <laughs> and um yeah uh, that'll be cool here's where mark fisher just throws down the gavel he says all of which all the advertising agencies and game manufacturers and embedded literature of branding consultancies all of which make one of inception's premises that it is difficult to implant an idea in someone's mind Strangely quaint, because advertising already does that. Isn't yeah, I, Inception what so much late capitalist cognitive labor is about? Oh my god, is late capitalism denying itself? Wow, Mark. Yeah, who would have thought that they would have like an ironic distance? That's at? like a weird, it's almost like pure ideology. <laughs> yeah, it's weird that like Inception has a line that says the opposite of the truth. Like, it's lying to you for an agenda. That's weird. For Inception to work, Arthur and Cobb tell Sato early in the film the subject must believe that the implanted idea is their own. The self-help dictums of psychotherapy, which Cobb affirms at the end of Inception, offer invaluable assistance in this ideological operation. As Eva Illouz argues discussing the very conversion of psychoanalysis into self-help that inception dramatizes if we secretly desire our misery then the self can be made directly responsible for alleviating it the contemporary freudian legacy is and ironically so that we are in the full master of in our own house even when or perhaps especially when it is on fire this kind of goes back to uh peterson zizek debate when Zizak goes, you know what I like about you, Mr. Jordan Peterson, is when you say, young men, clean your own damn room, bucko. And then he says, but what if the world outside of their room doesn't know how to clean itself? What if the rooms of the world are unclean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, or I'm paraphrasing, but that that's generally Zizek's retort to this kind of self-help bullshit. Right. Is that it's not that a person's room is necessarily unclean, it's that the unclean room reflects a general lack of stability outside the room. Yeah. 
and that we should maybe figure out what's going on outside the room in order for somebody to figure out how to clean their own room. Mm hmm <sighs> Well, yet our misery, like our dreams, our cars, and our refrigerators, is in fact the work of many anonymous hands. This impersonal misery may be what Inception is ultimately about. The ostensibly upbeat ending and all the distracting boy toy action cannot dispel the non-specific but pervasive pathos that hangs over the film. It's a sadness that arises from the impasses of a culture in which business has closed down any possibility of, the, of an outside. A situation that Inception exemplifies rather than comments on. You yearn for foreign places, but everywhere you go looks like local color for a film set of a commercial. You want to be lost in Escher-esque mazes, but you end up in an interminable car chase. Yeah. Anyway, good movie. Bad movie. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, <sighs> I'm glad you enjoyed that. If you did, if you're still with us, dear listener, see you next time. Don't know what the next essay is going to be, but... I'm sure we'll tell you next time.